Good morning, everybody. I want to start with a number, 2.5. Now, we have lots of important numbers in our lives, but I think this may be the most important number for the planet over the coming decades. So what is 2.5? This is the yearly average carbon budget for every person on the planet through 2050 if we are to have an 80% chance of limiting global warming to 2 degrees Celsius. Now, a lot of people are still talking about 1.5 degree uh, Celsius. I think that ship has sailed. It's hard enough to get to 2. I'd like to focus on that today. Here's another number, 17.19. This is what we calculate the average carbon emission per person per year is for this area, for Kendall Square. And actually, this area does much better than, than most places in the US. Now, this is operational energy, carbon emissions generated in use, and it's also the embodied carbon to produce the materials and, and systems that go into products. So we ask ourselves, how can we get to 2.5 tons by 2030 in this area? Is it even feasible? And how can we establish our priorities? There's a lot of magical thinking out there about climate and solutions. So uh, hopefully this is a bit of a reality check. The uh, new IPCC report has a hint as to what we should look at. And I'll read you this quote that I, I pulled out of the report. Urban areas represent 67 to 72 percent of global emissions. How new cities and towns are designed, constructed, managed, and powered, meaning basically the whole process, will lock in. Now, the lock in is important because that means it's very, very hard to change. Will lock in behavior, lifestyles, and future urban greenhouse gas emissions. We need action at, at every different scale, from individual behavior change all the way to international agreements. We need that top-down down government action. Carbon taxes, decarbonizing the grid. Underappreciated are those things that a city or a local community can do. These bottom-up, community-scale interventions, that's what we're focused on. And it's really key because 90% of population growth from here on out will take place in cities. As I mentioned, something like 70% of global emissions come from cities. 90% of wealth creation, most of the jobs, et cetera, will, will uh, be generated in cities. So again, this is where all the action is. So we, we conducted a thought experiment in my city science group, which is right downstairs here, to look at the possible transformation of MIT Kendall Square between now and 2030. What would it take? Uh, now, MIT is an amazing innovation district, maybe the greatest in the world, but as a community, it's actually quite dysfunctional. Go down to Main Street today on a Saturday and see how dead the place is. So we built what we call CityScope. It's this tangible model where groups of people can interact. We can look at land use and density and new systems, et cetera, and get real-time feedback with this radar plot and different different visualizations. Now, we're building at, in the back end a pretty sophisticated model. We think of it as our city science urban performance model. Uh, this looks a little overwhelming, but I'll just step you through a few of the elements. So up in the upper right, people living in the district, 9,800 people commuting in, 42,000 people, vast movement of people every day. We can look at then the urban interventions that could improve not only the environmental performance, but the social and the economic performance of the community. We're looking for those win-win-win scenarios, interventions that do all three. We can look at the improvement of energy consumption, CO2 emissions. We then have this fine-grained window through a radar plot into the various performance metrics. We can look at the development of clean energy sources, and the impact on, on the grid, et cetera. So let me step you through some of these interventions that can take place locally. But for, before we deal with the local interventions, let's just talk about renewable energy to the grid. Now, there's a lot of talk about wind and solar. Very hard in this area to find enough land to power a district like Kendall Square. In fact, you cover every surface in Kendall Square, every rooftop with photovoltaics, hardly moves the needle because it's too high density. 
But we accepted the 2030 Massachusetts grid decarbonization roadmap. You can see solar going up a little bit. So let's just accept that by 2030. And we're starting with 17.19. What does that do? It takes us down to about 15.81. It helps. We'll take it. Okay, electric vehicles. Now, we have the MIT Transportation Survey. We know where people live. We know where they work, their commuting mode. And we said, now, what if every person commuting in drove an electric vehicle by 2030? Well, it's interesting because the operational CO2 drops a bit, but the embodied energy goes up. There's tremendous embodied energy in an electric vehicle, in the batteries, the lithium, et cetera. The grid in Massachusetts is 77% fossil fuel, so most of the power you put into your Tesla is, is, not, is not renewable. It's not going to change much by 2030. So we look at this radar plot. Now, we dial electric vehicles up to 100%, and you can see a little bit of an improvement environmentally, almost no economic or social improvement. All right, 15.81, 15.5. Didn't save the planet. All right, hybrid work. Now, I got kind of excited about this during the pandemic because it would completely change commuting patterns. You know, work is being resorted right now. We haven't quite figured it out. Pre-pandemic, people would come into the corporate office typically. We're now evolving into much more of a workplace as a network. So people are working at home. People are working in cafes. Let's now dial hybrid work up. Now, we just said 100% of people are working three days a week. That's pretty aggressive. Almost no change. People still drive a lot locally. They crank up their air conditioning at home more. So hybrid work, get us down to maybe 15.3. Deep energy retrofitted buildings. I was also very excited about this. Now, when you look at these older buildings in a place like Kendall Square, they, they really do waste a lot of energy. So we can look at high performance air conditioning, low energy lighting and appliances. We can look at new sensors and controls, thermal insulation. Now, you have to realize that drops the operational energy, but you're also adding more embodied energy in the materials and, and the products. And you're, there, there's a cost of switching when you replace an old system from, with a new before it's at the end of its useful life. So let's look what happens uh, at our radar plot. Oh, well, we see some improvement environmentally, some in economic improvement. We can get better ventilation in buildings so the health goes up. So what does that do us to, for us? 15.3 down to about 14.3. It's pretty good. We saved a ton. Getting closer. Okay. Live work symmetry. Now, remember, 42,000 people were commuting in every day. So we said, what if everybody who worked at Kendall Square had an opportunity to live in Kendall Square in an affordable apartment designed specifically for their needs? So, again, we took this transportation survey and said, what if we effectively had net zero commuting? The same number of people are commuting out as commuting in every day. And we take our city scope model, and uh, this is great for this because we can move these land use codes, like here R is residential, O is office of different types. We can toggle on new systems, and as we look at these various scenarios for, to develop the property around MIT uh, to get housing for 42,000 people. So let's now look at our radar plot. Now we're cranking this up to 100%. Now that has a huge environmental positive impact, but also a tremendous social economic impact. The economic is that people have opportunities to exchange ideas 24-7. They're, they're walking more. The safety and security improves because there's more eyes on the street, uh, et cetera. So 14.3. Now we get down to 10.75, way more important than electric vehicles. Walkable access to amenities. People still have to drive to schools and shopping, et cetera. So then we'd look at walkable access to amenities. We have telecom data to understand the movements of people. We look at all of the amenities that people access. In Kendall Square, everything with a red X is uh, not available. We can then take our city scope model and look at walkable access, in this case, to parks. The table goes green when there's proper walkable access. We can do it with layers and layers of all the amenities. By the way, let me just take a, take a minute 
It's one thing to have a vision for what it should be. How could we get there? I do believe that restrictive zoning may be the greatest barrier to climate change solutions. So we're looking at dynamic incentive-based algorithmic zoning. Very simple. You might take an existing zoning envelope. Maybe it's a three-story building. You might double that with an opt-in system. You take 50% of that increased value. You, you put it into assets that could be pro-social, central housing, daycare, grocery, et cetera. You could even create an endowment, and you could compensate the people that live closest to that project. So they have a financial stake in the building. You could, it could all be dynamic. So over time, the, all these uh, incentives change. We can deploy the things that we're all thinking about in this building, smart contracts and data analytics and simulation. So there are mechanisms that could get us there. So walkable access to amenities, also pretty tremendous improvement in environmental, economic, and social. 10.75, we go down to something like 8.54. Hyper-efficient places of living. So we've been working on these compact apartments for many years. We launched a company called Ori Living. This is uh, an apartment in New York that is a showcase. Some random person shot this TikTok video that I liked. So uh, walk-in closet, office on demand, the bed comes down in the ceiling. And there, you can do small, medium, large, et cetera, apartments. So not just about the small apartments. You can effectively double the utilization of space. And we can take our CityScope platform, move these little modules around, and see the impact. All right, what does that do? OK. Has a, Modest environmental impact, but pretty good economic social benefit. 8.54, so we got 8.2. Lightweight community scale mobility. So we've, for years, been working on these little uh, lightweight community mobilities. You now don't need cars, remember? Nobody's commuting. Everybody has walkable access to amenities. You can see this down in the lobby. We have it on, the, on display down there. We've built different versions of this. This is the MIT persuasive electric vehicle. You call for it like an Uber, comes to you wherever you are. We have a version of this as a uh, autonomous bicycle. So the bike comes to you wherever you are like an Uber, you drive it to your destination, turns into a, a three-wheel autonomous vehicle. So that improves the, you know, all three pretty effectively. Now, we still need power. We've lowered the energy consumption, I think, as far as we can. Solar is not really viable, I don't think, in the short term. So low carbon, high density community power. We're very interested in these nuclear batteries that can be shipped on the back of a truck. You can have a few of these that could power a place like Kendall Square. Ultimately, we'll have fusion reactors. Maybe by 2040, we're looking at how can we build fusion-ready cities. So we have all of the infrastructure in place. You just replace the heat source when we're ready. So that brings us up pretty significantly in terms of energy. So we go from 8.17 to 7.33, low-carbon diet. Local production, typical American diet, 2.8 tons of carbon per person a year. That's more than the total goal, right? We might be able to bring it down to something like 1.4. How might we do that using hydroponics, aeroponics? This is a prototype from our lab that was, again, right downstairs looking at hydroponic growth of vegetables. There's a whole explosion of automated um, food production systems. And we have lab-grown uh, meat. And now we have in our radar plot a perfect circle. We have this community in harmony, but we're only down to 5.9. We've done all these aggressive interventions. What's left? Well, these are the, the local solutions, but we, we still need to look at things like uh, air travel. I used to fly over an ocean every three or four weeks. I basically don't anymore. That might get us down to 4.13. You know, the internet consumes a huge amount of power. If we can do that with zero energy servers, local manufacturing, all of that. But maybe we get it down to 2.5. I believe that we need to do a better job for preparing the planet for children, which is why I think we need to focus on these hyperlocal solutions to global warming. So thank you.